Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, bring up my charts, please. Uh, I was asked to represent NASA's current use of the evolved expendable launch vehicle. Uh, next chart, please. I'm going to first just put that into a little bit of, uh, of context. <coughs> Uh, we have a NASA Launch Services Program uh, that was consolidated in 1998 at our Kennedy Space Center. Uh, and this is our acquisition arm and also provides our uh, mission assurance and, and management for commercial launch services <coughs> that NASA acquires for, for its missions. We don't own the vehicles. Uh, we buy commercial services in this case. Uh, we use a mixed fleet of vehicles, range of performance classes, uh, and uh, we support, uh, to a, the largest degree, our science mission directorate with their programs, uh, but also some other uh, NASA directorates. Uh, for example, the, the LRO mission that's on the pad today uh, is for Exploration Systems Mission Directorate. Uh, and we also do some launch services for other government agencies. Uh, we use a variety of ranges, including uh, out at uh, Kwajalein, at, at Wallops, Kodiak, as well as the, the well-known uh, uh, Cape Canaveral and, and out at Vandenberg. Uh, we have a contract mechanism known as the NASA Launch Services Contract. Uh, this is uh, set up uh, as a, uh, a, a competition-based contract. Uh, Proposers for launch services uh, on ramp to this contract. We have a fixed price uh, arrangement, and as we have a particular mission we're ready uh, to uh, purchase a service for, then we do a competition based on the mass, the orbit, the class of payload, and the best value to the government. Uh, we are in the process of uh, extending that contract, uh, so uh, we have a longer ordering period because the current one expires next year. Uh, most recently, we did a, uh, a buy of uh, launch services for four missions, uh, tracking and data relay satellite, uh, the radiation belt storm probes, and the magnetospheric multiscale mission. All of those uh, were selected to go on an Atlas V. Uh, some of the issues we're facing in launch services is uh, loss of a medium class uh, launch service provider, which has been uh, 50% of NASA's missions historically, particularly for, for science, were in transition, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, we have a compressed manifest, um, and uh, we're also uh, looking to the future as uh, how the, uh, the infrastructure costs are shared across the government. Next chart, please. Uh, this is our current uh, planning manifest that we have. Uh, and I'll just make a couple general comments. If you look at the small class at the top, um, you'll see uh, that we have uh, an oversupply of vehicles and an underutilization. Uh, if you look in the medium class, uh, this demonstrates the transition period that we're in with the Delta II uh, discontinuation. And since there's a bit of a lead time when we put out a proposal for our science missions, you've seen a, a shift over into that intermediate class. Um, and uh, if you look in those awards that we have given in that uh, intermediate to heavy class, um, NASA is a uh, uh, strong user of the, the Atlas V. Next, please. Uh, this is just a snapshot of, of our, uh, our history of launches uh, with regard to the expendable launch vehicle. Um, NASA's first use of Atlas V was back in 2002. I'm sorry, um, the first Atlas V was launched in 2002, and NASA's first use was in 2005 for the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, and uh, the uh, first use of Delta IV, NASA has not had its own mission on it, but GOES um, was on Delta IV in, in 2006, and another GOES mission is on the, on the pad right now for a Delta IV for a launch scheduled for the 26th. Uh, and we've had a very, very good track record across our program, uh, which was recently marred with the failure of a Taurus with uh, the orbiting carbon observatory on board. Next, please. Uh, this is really just uh, provided to the committee for reference. These are the, uh, the small uh, launch vehicles that are available to us to use. Next. 
Uh, and then this is the medium to intermediate and heavy class vehicles, and it gives you a sense of the, the range of, of capabilities <coughs> that they offer. Next, please. I uh, want to talk a little bit about some considerations. Um, obviously, for the EELV, uh, given that range of vehicles, um, this being the highest performance class, it is uh, at the high end of the cost spectrum as well. Uh, and uh, another factor to keep in mind is that uh, the Department of Defense uh, currently covers the infrastructure uh, for, uh, for maintaining this EELV capability. Uh, the National Space Transportation Policy calls for a review no later than 2010 to evaluate the long-term requirements, funding, and management responsibilities and infrastructure. Uh, so that is something that we as a government will have to address across the agencies as to whether the, the current financial uh, base uh, will be the one we continue to use or not. Uh, for our science missions, uh, going to EELV uh, is required for certain missions, but it also, in many cases, is more performance than we actually need. Um, and if we use that level, um, not only do we have the, the higher cost of that vehicle, uh, but it also can increase the cost of the payload, particularly if uh, they start growing to, to fill that performance capability. And the more we pay for launch services means the less we have available for science missions. So those are very closely linked in what we can accomplish in our program. Uh, with regard to infrastructure, um, we have a pad on each coast for, uh, for each of the EELV vehicles available. Uh, we are finding uh, recently that the payload processing facilities near the pads um, are limited and becoming a bit of a bottleneck, and uh, we've been uh, collectively working on, on uh, how, to, how to deal with that. Uh, with regard to the industrial base, I'll just say again, we have an oversupply in the small class. Uh, we have some uncertainty in the medium class. Uh, you will hear about the, the uh, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program and our Commercial Resupply Services. Uh, and uh, so uh, wearing my hat of overseeing the Space Station Program, we very much want uh, Commercial Resupply Services to succeed, to uh, uh, help us to sustain the station. And wearing my Launch Services hat, um, I want them to succeed because uh, those are very likely new medium-class vehicles that we can use for our science missions. So the station is becoming kind of a market, uh, initial market entry for them for us. Uh, there are questions in the industrial base about um, uh, related to mergers and supply chains. Um, there's always a tension between having parallel capabilities and uh, merging things for efficiency. Uh, and uh, the question is to what degree do you integrate or use the same components? Uh, and uh, gain those efficiencies, but then if you have a failure, do you have a fleet-wide impact uh, where we're, we're all grounded for a period of time? There's a line about uh, mo multiple users' risk approaches. Um, that is to say that uh, NASA, the Air Force, NRO, commercial customers, we each have our own way of looking at and assessing risk. Uh, for our missions and what our fallback options are. Uh, for NASA, uh, we have been in the mode, particularly with our science missions, of flying unique payloads, one of a kind, don't have a backup. Um, others may be doing uh, constellations uh, or um, a series of, series of satellites so they have a, a different posture and that affects how we look at mission assurance how much risk we're willing to accept what kind of reviews we need to do uh, the schedule right now is a crowded man manifest especially for atlas 5 uh, and uh, again we've been working collectively across the the community to see what we can do to increase the, the throughput there uh, just a couple things to, to think about if, uh, if one were to go down the path of doing human rating on um, EELV. Uh, given our use of these for all these other missions uh, and different approaches to, to risk, um, would there be two lines of, of vehicles or one? 
um, would there be a separate infrastructure or would we have to figure out how to share pads and processing facilities and so on? Um, and to what degree would we have common systems that affect the fleet or different risk assessments for human versus robotic missions? And so those are all just, I'm not giving you answers, I'm just giving you things to think about um, as, as you look at this. And uh, I provided in some backup slides that just shows you the, the history of the, uh, the vehicles, but that was all I had to present. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Lynn? Go ahead, Bo. When you talk about risk, do you mean like loss of mission yes. numbers? Yes. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, there are questions, uh, questions about um, are, are we ready to launch or not? Um, are you willing to go, uh, do you want to go on a, um, a vehicle that has a long uh, history uh, of successful missions or are you uh, willing to accept a higher risk and be a, a demonstration payload or an early payload on a new mission? Those, those kinds of things. Let me just follow up on it. You had on this uh, on this table on page five, I guess, low, medium, low for the risk. Do you actually use numbers like LOM, like our constellation friends do, or or, or do you? Uh, we actually have a, a a series of we go by by a, a set of categories where um, once once a vehicle has been certified to a certain category. Um, then we have our payloads uh, certified to a particular category. So if you are, um, let's say, a Mars rover mission that we consider um, very critical, one of a kind, uh, put a huge investment into it, then we're going to want to go on a vehicle that has, has a, a, a more reliable history or has been certified to a certain level. If you are a payload that's in a different category that's willing to accept risk, then, then we'll match it to a different type of vehicle. So it's, it's not so much uh, loss of mission numbers as it is trying to pair from the beginning which payload goes on what kind of vehicle. Thank you. Um, I think it's really great that you have, as an organization, worked out how to manage all this risk and put you know, nationally critical high-value payloads on these launchers. How much does that mission assurance activity that you do contribute to the total cost of the mission? Uh, that's a hard one to measure, I think. Uh, there, was, there was a study done a number of years ago that looked across uh, NASA, Air Force, and NRO management approaches um, and looked at our respective track records uh, and came to the conclusion that we were adding value uh, through that mission assurance approach, but I think it's always uh, subject to some level of judgment as how far you go. Uh, in, our, in our contract, we have, uh, we have put in place certain things where we want to just have insight and others where we want some stronger uh, oversight given that they're not our vehicles. Um, but they are our payloads, and so I think over time we've worked through that with our contractors as to what our, our respective roles are. Any other questions? All right, I'll hand off to my ULA colleague. 